Hey folks, uh, Nick Mock 007 here again, and today we're going to continue our discussion on euthanasia. Um, I want to thank everyone who's made comments and uh, joined in this conversation. Um, I really do want to hear from all of you, uh, so please leave comments again today. Um, you know, I think that's the best part of YouTube, uh, sharing knowledge and the conversations it can generate. Now, a few quick reminders. This is part two of the series. In the first part, we took a, just a brief look at the history and ethics of euthanasia. Um, today, we're going to take an overview on methods um, and examine a couple other topics, including um, unconsciousness, perception of pain, distress, uh, and the human-animal relationship. Uh, then finally, in part three, we'll examine the mechanisms, um, disposal of remains, and specific methods to humanely euthanize your fish and invertebrates. As I've said before, I know many folks may only be interested in that third part when I talk about how to euthanize, and, and, and that's fine. Uh, just go ahead and skip these first two parts, um, you know, won't hurt my feelings. Uh, but for those of you interested in the science of all of it, uh, stick with me one more time today. Again, just to remind you, when I reference euthanasia in this series, I'm, I'm only referring to it in regards to non-human animals. Um, and also remember that I'm basing uh, this whole series on the American Veterinary Medical Association, uh, or AVMA's, uh, white paper on this same topic. So see the description below, I'll, I'll put a link down there. Um, if you're interested in reading it for yourself. Okay, let's go ahead and jump in, starting with an overview on euthanasia methods. In order to best understand uh, these uh, methods, the AVMA outlines multiple criteria to help us uh, ensure a humane death. Uh, I'm not going to read through all of the criteria, there's quite a few of them, but I'll list all of them over there on the screen. Um, but I wanted to highlight a couple of relevant ones for us. Uh, so the ability to induce loss of consciousness and death with a minimum of pain and distress, um, time required to induce loss of consciousness, uh, the reliability of the method, um, the emotional effects on the observers, uh, drug availability, and safety for predators um, or scavengers should the animal's uh, remains be consumed. Uh, and uh, the last one I wanted to highlight was the environmental impacts uh, of the method or um, disposition of the animal's remains. Now, a few other things to consider. Uh, the selection of the most appropriate method of euthanasia, um, of course, depends on the specific species. You, know, you can think of you know, little tiny fish and, and some of our big fish, um, but also depends on skill of the person euthanizing the animal, um, among some other considerations. Also, let me say that it's crucial that death be verified after euthanasia um, and before you dispose of the animal. Depending on the method, um, you know, especially if you use some kind of anesthetic, the animal can actually appear to be dead, but might eventually recover, so death must be confirmed. Additionally, safe handling and disposal uh, of animal remains is also critically important, um, especially if the animal was suspected to have some communicable disease, um, but we'll look more closely at disposing of the remains in the third part of the series. So now let's turn to some important areas. Um, you know, when we consider euthanasia, first, consciousness and unconsciousness is, is something we've got to address. Um, unconsciousness can be defined as the loss of individual awareness and, and, and occurs when the brain's ability to integrate information is disrupted. Um, in humans, the onset of uh, anesthetic-induced unconsciousness has been functionally defined uh, by the loss of appropriate um, response to verbal commands. Now, obviously, we can't use verbal commands in, in most animals, but certainly not fish. Um, so we use what's called the uh, loss of the writing reflex, which is just a reflex that corrects the orientation of the body um, when it's taken out of the normal upright position. Now, this is a well-established definition um, introduced over 160 years ago, and is still useful today because it's an easily observable, um, integrated whole animal response. Um, physical methods that destroy or, or render non-functional the brain regions, uh, regions uh, responsible for cortical integration obviously produce um, this instantaneous um, unconsciousness. Now, next, we examine pain and its perception. Criteria for a painless death can only be established after we better understand the mechanisms of pain. So, let me give you some definitions and I'll break it down. Uh, the perception of pain can be defined as a, a conscious experience. And the International Association for the Study of Pain, which I didn't know about until I made this video, uh, describes it as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. But when I was in school, I was always taught a definition uh, proposed by Margot McCaffrey that says, um, pain is whatever the experiencing person says it is, existing whenever the experiencing person says it does. 
Though, obviously, this definition is problematic for non-human animals, or really for anyone who's non-verbal. The perception of pain um, based on mammalian models requires nerve impulses from peripheral uh, nociceptors to reach a functioning and conscious cerebral cortex um, and the associated subcortical brain regions. Now, I know that sounds complicated, so let's break that down in plain language. All it means is that a nerve cell that uh, can sense pain like in the periphery, like in your hand, uh, transmits a pain signal all the way from your hand to your brain. Now, without this transmission, you can't perceive the pain. Now, in addition to mechanical and thermal stimulation of these nociceptors or pain nerve cells, a variety of endogenous substances can also generate nociceptive impulses. Again, all that means in, in plain terms is that um, external things like a hot stove um, and internal things um, in your own body, such as uh, things like hydrogen ions, can, can cause pain. Now, pain is subjective in the sense that individuals can differ in their perceptions of pain intensity, uh, as well as in their physical and behavioral responses to it. And although the perception of pain requires a conscious experience, defining consciousness and, and therefore the ability to perceive pain um, across species, especially you know, species like fish, can be quite difficult. In our case, it was previously believed that fish and invertebrates lack the anatomical structures necessary to, to perceive pain, at least as we understand it in birds and mammals. Uh, however, compelling recent evidence indicates that fish possess the components of nociceptive processing systems similar to those found in terrestrial vertebrates. Now, numerous studies to date have moved this issue forward. Now, we're really at the point that the evidence supports the position that fish should be accorded the same considerations as terrestrial vertebrates, um, at least when we're talking about in regard to relief from pain. All that to say, while there does remain some debate on this issue, to the best of our knowledge, fish can feel pain, or at the very least, they absolutely do respond to noxious stimuli, or put it in plain terms, what we would consider painful stimuli. Okay, now let's look at stress and distress along a continuum. Without this understanding, how can we minimize distress? So stress has been defined as the effect of physical, physiologic, or emotional factors that induce an alteration in the animal's homeostasis, or you can think of that as the resting or, or normal state. The response of an animal to stress represents the uh, adaptive process that's necessary to restore the baseline mental and physiologic state and it can vary according to numerous factors. Uh, these include, but, but certainly aren't limited to, things like the animal's experience, its age, um, the animal's species, the environment, uh, the current physiological or, or psychological state of that animal. So to look at the continuum, let's consider three phases of stress. At one end, we've got eustress. Uh, eustress results from harmless stimuli. Uh, when these harmless stimuli initiate adaptive responses that are beneficial to the animal, so you can think of this as good stress. Second, we have neutral stress. Uh, neutral stress results when the animal's response to the stimuli cause neither harmful nor beneficial effects to the animal. And then third, distress, which what it sounds like, bad stress, results when an animal's response to stimuli interferes with its well-being or its comfort. To avoid distress, we should really strive to euthanize animals within the animal's physical uh, and behavioral comfort zones. So you can think of this like be, uh, their preferred temperatures for fish uh, and things like natural habitats. Now, moving to animal behavior, we, we consider the need to minimize uh, animal distress, including negative, affective, or experientially based states like uh, fear, um, aversion, anxiety, and apprehension. Um, these must be considered uh, in determining the method of euthanasia. Uh, for example, virtually all animals when placed in a novel environment find that to be stressful. Therefore, uh, a euthanasia approach that can be applied in familiar surroundings can help reduce stress. Now, uh, I wanted to briefly touch on one more thing today. Any discussion of euthanasia of our animals would not be complete without considering um, the emotional attachment between an animal and the owner slash caretaker. Um, while I don't have a lot to say given that this video is already running longer than I planned, uh, I did want to acknowledge this. The decision to euthanize is usually accompanied by many strong emotions, you know, things like uh, guilt, sadness, shock, disbelief, grief, etc. And for us to take this human component um, out of this would be a, a pretty big mistake. So again, 
just wanted to mention that um, and uh, talk about the human side of euthanasia. Now, again, I know this has been a little bit more of a somber, serious topic than a lot of my other videos. Uh, so I want to thank all of you who have made it all the way through this second part today. Um, I'll have part three out, should be by next week, um, where we'll look at, remember, again, the specific methods. So we'll talk about how to euthanize, um, but we'll also look at things like uh, how to properly dispose of remains. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.